Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to OLT 133 Language and Literature. Today we are going to discuss Module 6, which is the language of literature, elements of registers, and points of views. My name is Johanna Makeja John. Uh, one of the instructors of this course from the Open University of Tanzania. With this module, we are going to see the language of literature. And when looking at the language of literature, we are going to discuss about the language of prose, the language of poetry, the language of drama, and we shall also look at the elements of registers and points of views. Now let us look at the language of prose. According to Thornborough, Thornborough and Weir, 1998, page 146, fiction is a generic term that includes short stories, novellas, and novels. Our discussion focuses on the language of the three subgenres of prose fiction. Thornborough and Waring, 1988, page 183, provide a checklist for one who is interested in doing a stylistic analysis of prose. The checklist is as follows. Does the text appear to be readily or writerly? What sort of demands does it make on the reader? For example, what effort will it take you to read Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart and Wole Soyinka's The Interpreters? Which of these texts do you think is readily and which is writerly? That is the checklist. What kind of narrative voice or voices are there in the text? Is it first person or third person? What are the linguistic devices used to represent time, place, and dialogue in the text? What is the structure of the plot and narrative development? For example, is there a resolution or ending? Or no narrative closure? Is the story linear? Or does the writer represent events in a non-linear way? In general, the novel, as said earlier, is much more accessible than any of the, than any of the other two major literary genres. However, in spite of its accessibility, the novel is probably the most difficult genre to analyze. It is by far the most complex genre in terms of discourse structure, which leads to its complexity in terms of viewpoint. Shock 1986 says that the study of point of view is central to the study of the novel. Let us look at the, at the general features of the language of prose. And here we shall look at the I narrator and the third person narrator. To begin with, I narrator. What do we mean by I narrator? The person who tells the story may also be a character in the fictional world of the story, reciting the story after the event. In this case, Critics call the narrator a first person or a narrator. When the narrator refers to himself or herself in the story, the first person pronoun I is used. Since the narrator is a character looking back on events, but often representing them as if they were happening for the first time, first person narrators are said to be limited. They don't know all the facts. Or they trick the reader by withholding information or telling untruth. 
This sort of thing often happens in murder and mystery stories. For example, in a challenge to men of the people, the eye narrator is used. We only get information about events of the story through the central character, Obi Okonko. When Obi tells us the political situation and his pitiable involvement, because he's the first person narrator, we are forced to sympathize with him. Let us look at the third person narrator. If the narrator is not a character in the fictional world, he or she is usually called a third person narrator because reference to all the characters in the fictional world of the story will involve the use of the third person pronouns he, she, it, or they. The third person narrator is the dominant narrator type. This is because first person narrators can also be characters that they can easily be unreliable. The third person narrators, because they can often be assumed to be the authors, are much more usually omniscient. Hence, when a third person narrator is limited or unreliable, the effect is very heavily foregrounded. Narrators usually tell us things, and so most of the senses in novels are statements. Let us look at the linguistic indicators of viewpoint. The linguistic indicators of point of view. We have three deuses given versus new information and foregrounding. Now, to begin with deuses, deuses is the term which linguists use to denote pointing expressions pointing expressions like this, like this, that, here, there, which are speaker related. To Dr. Eta, Eta Lee, 1997, page 152, deities are directing or pointing words insofar as they direct our attention particular point of reference. Deictic expressions cut across the grammar of English. For example, this and that are demonstrative determinants or pronouns. Here and there are deictic adverbs. And come, that is movement towards the speaker, and go there is movement away from the speaker, a deity verbs. Deity surprise to time as well as space as the contrasts between the adverbs now, meaning time close to the speaker, and then time remote from the speaker show. Because deity is speaker related, it can easily be used to indicate particular and changing viewpoints thereby influencing the meaning of the novel. Let us look at given versus new information. Linguists make a distinction between what they call given and new information in terms of how information is arranged by speakers. If you want to refer to something which is not already known to your RVC, you will use the definite reference like there. In other words, you take your addressee's viewpoint into account. The indefinite article A is used to refer to something new, something we do not know yet, something we do not, we do not yet know about. For example, one can say, I saw a man. That means the man is unknown to the hearer. But if I say, the man is my friend's father, that means the man is known to the hearer. So with those two examples, you can see what it actually means by given versus new information. 
The definite article there is given because both the speaker and the hearer have something, have some background information about the man. So it refers to the given information. There is also used to describe general information. Many modern novels and stories begin with the definite reference, even though in theory they should not. This technique, positioning readers as you're already in the known, even though they are not really, is one aspect of a technique which has come to be called in media's dress. This is a Latin phrase for us to feel intimately involved with what is going on at the beginning of a story. Now let us look at foreground. Deviation, which is a linguistic phenomenon, has an important psychological effect on readers. If a part of writing is deviant, it becomes especially not sharp or perceptually prominent. This is called foregrounding. The term foregrounding, according to Short 1996, page 11, is borrowed from art criticism. It implies that nothing in a work of art is significant, but the fact is that the matter in the foregrounding is more important than the rest. In the language of prose, there is a background. Foregrounding is, in large part, the portions of a text or talk which do not conform to the normal rules and expectations. Foregrounding is thus produced as a result of deviation from linguistic norms of various kinds. Foregrounding can also be manifested in capitalization. Except for proper nouns, nouns do not have their initial letters capitalized. But if a writer does that to a noun that is not a proper noun, the writer has, foreg has foregrounded that lexical item. It could also be manifested in word, order, and in coinages. So Inca's Aik and Ibadan contain many examples of coinages and graphological foregrounding, which include the use of capitalization. Let's look now at the language of poetry. Poetry is a form of literature that uses language in a very special way. It is the expression of intense feelings in a very imaginative way. Poetry exists in the verse form. According to Ogum, Ogumbesan and Gurga, 1978, poetry is a vital and meaningful form of expression by which the individual poet may convey thoughts and feelings in experience. Our traditional African heritage is very, very rich in poetry. Poetry is simply a renewal of words. Whenever we pick up a poem to read, the impression we are given is that language is spiritual, as insubstantial as breath on a, on a winter's day. For us to get closer to poetry, we need to fine tune our day. For us to get closer to poetry, we need to fine-tune our sens sensitivity to language and to its histories, overtones, rhythms, meanings, and suggestions. Language makes a successful poem. If we endeavor to have a relationship with poetry, we will become more sensitive to language, we will start getting the age to identify instances of beauty, sensations to meanings, in a single phrase and in a well-tuned line. Poetry will always give us the enablement to pay rapt, rapt attention both to poems and to life in general. Now let us look at the forms of poetry. For our purpose here, we shall discuss just the following forms of poetry. We shall, dis we shall look at real poem and its forms, like illage, ode, and sonnet. And then we shall look at the narrative poetry and its forms, like epic and mock epic, ballad, and lastly we shall look at didactic poetry. 
Now, what is a lyric poem? A lyric poem is a relatively short, non-narrative poem in which a single speaker unfolds a state of mind or an emotional state. Lyric poetry retains some of the elements of song, which is said to be its origin. For the Greek writers, the lyric was a song accompanied by the lyre, a plucked steam instrument associated with ancient Greece. The lyric poem has various forms like elegy, ode, and sonnet. What is an ode? And what is an elegy? To begin with ode. Ode is a long lyric poem with a serious theme written in an elevated style. Good examples are Wordsworth's hymn to duty and Keats' ode to a gracious end. Illage. What is illage? In modern usage, illage is a ceremonial lament for the death of a particular person. For example, ten songs in, memo in memoriam. In memoriam, A-H-H. A-H-H. In another form, the term illage is used for solemn meditations, often on questions of death, such as grace, illage written in a country churchyard. What is a sonnet? A sonnet is the most widespread and most formal and most formal of reading poems. Originally, the sonnet was a love poem which left with the lover's sufferings and hopes. It originated in Italy and turned out to be popular in England in the Renaissance when Thomas Watt and the Ill of Surrey translated and imitated the sonnets written by Patrick Chan Smith. After the 17th century, the sonnet was used for other topics than love, for instance, religious experience by Donnie and Milton, reflections on art by Keats and Shelley, war experience by Brooke and Owen. Sonnet is written in a single stanza of 14 lines with an intricate pattern. Now let us look at narrative poetry. What are narrative poems? A narrative poetry gives a verbal depiction. Verbal depiction, that's why it is called narrative. In verse, of a series of connected events and it drives characters through a plot. It is always conveyed by a narrator. Narrative poems might tell of a love story, like Ted Son's Mao, the account of a father and son, like Wordsworth. Michael, all the deeds of a hero, heroine, like Walter Scott's Lay of the Last Minstrel. Narrative poetry has categories such as epic and ballad. What is an epic? Epic operates on a large scale. It's a, very, it's a very long poem. Its content is large, both in length and topic, such as the founding of a nation, exemplified by Virgil's Island, or the start of world history, exemplified in Milton's Paradise Lost. It relies on the use of an elevated style of language and supernatural beings take part in the action. Epic is a long narrative poem, grand both in theme and style, and it deals with famous or historical events of national or universal significance involving actions of broad sweep and grandeur. Most epics operate on the exploits of a single individual therefore giving unity to the composition. What is more epic? It makes 
as it makes use of epic conventions. Mock epic makes use of makes use of epic conventions like the elevated style and the assumption that the topic is of great importance to deal with completely to deal with completely in significant occurrences. Mock epic is derived from the serious epic. It satirizes present day ideas of situations in form in a form and style by skewing the serious epic. A famous example is poem's The Rape of the Rock, which conveys the tale of a young beauty whose suitor secretly cuts off a lock of her hair. What is a ballad? It is a song, initially transmitted orally, which tells a story. It is a vital form of folk poetry, which was adapted for literary uses from the 16th century onwards. A ballad is a short narrative folk song that deals with the most dramatic part of the story, stirring to its conclusion by means of dialogue and sequence of incidents. The word, the word ballad was first used in a broad sense to mean a simple short poem. Such a poem could be narrative or lyric, sung or not sung, crude or polite, sentimental or satiric, religious or secular. It was vaguely associated with dance. In terms of structure, a ballad is often in a stanza, usually a four-line stanza. And what is didactic poetry then? The purpose of, the, of a didactic poem is principally to teach some lesson. That is the main aim, to teach a lesson. This can take the form of very precise instructions, such as how to catch a fish, as in James Thompson's The Seasons, or ways of writing good poetry, as we have in Pope's essay on criticism. However, it can also be meant as informative in a general way. Until the 20th century, all literature was expected to have a didactic purpose in a general sense. That is, to impart moral, theoretical, or even practical knowledge. To this effect, Horace, in particular, demanded the poetry should combine learning and pleasure. For instance, Bryant's poetry was frequently didactic. He is best remembered for his beautiful descriptions of scenes in the Berkshire Hills of Massachusetts. For Bryant, nature was a symbol, was a symbol of the power of God and a moral influence on humanity. Let us look at poetry and sound patterns. Poetry and sound patterns. A good poet thinks more than what a word means. He also considers how a word sounds. The sound of a well-chosen word can strengthen a mood or make an idea more forceful. The sounds of words can also create a musical quality in a piece of writing. In order to teach special sound effects, poets make use of alliteration, assonance, rhyme, rhythm, and onomatopoeia, among other things. To begin with alliteration, poets call our attention to certain words in a line of poetry by using alliteration. Now, what is this alliteration? Alliteration is the repetition of the same consonant sound at the beginning of words that are close together. These words may be consecutive in a line. It is used to create a pleasant rhythmic effect. Let us see the exuberance of alliteration in the following line. Look at this line. Give me the spreading silent sound with your 
his being is full, does he? Give me the splendid silent sun. Splendid silent sun. The sound keeps repeating in the three consecutive ways, and that makes a good example of an impression. What is assonance? Assonance refers to the repetition of vowel sounds to stress words or ideas. Assonance is used to add a musical quality to a poem. It helps in setting the mood of a poem. In general, long vowels, long vowel sounds suggest either a free, joyful mood or a strange mood. On the other hand, Short vowels usually suggest a harsher, tighter, or more delicate mood. Let us pay attention to the long vowel in the following poem. What effect does this create in the poem? Look at this piece of a poem. He who from zone of zone guides through the boundless sky by certain flights in the long way that I must trade alone will lead my steps all right. I repeat, he who from zone of zone guides through the, bound, the boundless sky that is set in flight in the long way that I must trade alone will lead my steps all right. You can see most of uh, long syllables, there is plenty of long syllables in these four verses. And this gives us an idea of a joyous mood, a joyful mood, a free mood, and not a strange mood. Let's look at rhyme. Rhyme gives a musical quality to poetry. Rhyme simply occurs at the ends of lines in a poem. If two or more lines end in the same sound, we say they rhyme. If, I repeat, if two or more lines end in the same sound, we say they rhyme. Letters are used to describe the rhyme scheme of a poem. In this example here, we shall see how letters A and B have been used to describe rhymes. Each rhyming sound is assigned a different letter and lines that rhyme are given the same letter. For instance, let's examine the use of rhyme in this, these four lines. The railroad track is miles away, and the day is loud with voices speaking. Yet there isn't a train goes by all day, but I hear it's whistling shriek. The first line ends with the word away, and the third line ends in the word day. Away and day rhyme. And the second line ends with the, with the word speaking. And the fourth ends with the word shrieking. So speaking and shrieking rhyme. That means they end with similar sounds or exactly the same sound. In this poem, As we have already said, one and three may be given with the same letter, since they rhyme, and two and four may, give, may be assigned the similar, this, another letter, since they rhyme. So you can say A, B, A, B. Generally, the use of intonation and the alternation of stressed and unstressed syllables together with rhythm, help to create sound effects in poetry. And rhythm can suggest meaning in poetry. Let us look at onomatopoeia. Poets use this to add excitement to the sound of the poem. It is the imitation of natural sounds by words. For example, you can hear a, you can hear a caller and wine cry. Her voice is thin and her moan is high, and her crackling laugh or backing cold. 
bring terror to the young and old. Look at these four lines very, very carefully. You can hear her horror and wine cry. Her voice is thin and her moan is high. Voice is thin and her moan is high. And her crackling laugh all back in cold. Bring terror to the young and old. You can see how words are used to reflect the resemblance between words and the senses they represent. Let's look what the other figures of speech like metaphor. Aristotle declared that what a poet needs beyond everything else is a command of metaphor, the ability to see similarity in things is similar. Metaphor similes a poetry, a, a, poet, a, a poetry's most constant properties. Theirs is the power of illuminating and establishing a kinship between objects, wholly unlike each other. Look at the following examples of metaphor. I'm sorry that country is not in working order. I'm sorry that planet is out of service. Let's start in the first. I'm sorry that country is not in working order. The country is likened to something that is not in working order. And the planet is likened to something that is out of service. So you can see how metaphor makes comparison between two and like things. That is a direct comparison between two and like things. Let's look at simile. A simile expresses a comparison between two and like things with the, with, with the use of as or like, or even as the dash as. The things compared are shown to be similar in some respect, but are usually different by their nature in general. For example, Sadiku's tongue is as sharp as a blade. So Sadiku's tongue uh, is, 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 is compared with a sharp blade. A sharp blade. He is like a tiger. The behavior of the guy is compared to that of a tiger with the use of like and in the first sentence with the use of as dash dash as. Those are examples of similes. We have snake dot, snake dot. This is a figure of speech in which a part is used for a word or vice versa. That means something small represents something big. For example, when two a uh, football when two football clubs from two different countries are, are in contest one may say nigeria is meeting ghana today in a friendly football match so if a, 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 a certain football club in nigeria stands for nigeria and a certain football club from Ghana may stand for Ghana. Hence, Nigeria is meeting Ghana today in a friendly football match. Let's look at personification. Personification is a form of comparison which attributes human characteristics to, to, to abstractions of things which are not human. When Milton says that the flags clap their hands, and Confucian heard his voice. He is individualizing the frogs as if they were people and endowing Confucian with personal life. Yes, the frogs clap their hands. Can really frogs clap hands? Anyway, in, lit in literature it is possible. Frogs can be assigned human attributes to be able to clap hands. Another wind complains all day how someone treated him. So the narrow wind here is assigning a human attribute of complaining. That is a good example of personification. What is metonym? This is a figure of speech in which an object is used to stand for its users. The object is used to stand for its users. For example, the pen is mightier than the sword. 
What does this statement mean? The pen is mightier than the sword. The pen can stand for the educated people, and the sword can stand for the uneducated, ignorant, and violent people. So the pen stands for the educated. The sword stands for the ignorant and violent. Hence, a figure of speech in which a figure of speech in which an object is used to stand for its uses. Let us look at iron. What is an iron? An iron is a literal device that is dry, humorous, or lightly sarcastic within a speech in which words are used to convey a meaning contrary to their literal sense. Iron is an expression of doubt meaning and a statement in which the words suggest the opposite of their literal sense. Let's see an example of ironic titles. Take for example, An Enemy of the People by Henry Gibson and A Man of the People by Jim Wachet. Starting with An Enemy of the People by Henry Gibson. For those that have read the book, you can see the character who is referred to as the enemy of the people is really not the enemy of the people. And in A Man of the People by Chibu Achebe, the character who is referred to as a man of the people is really not a man of the people. So these titles are ironic. They are ironic. What is hyperbole? Hyperbole is an, is an exaggeration employed to give force or intensity to a statement. It is a form of inordinate exaggeration according to which a person or thing is depicted as being better or worse, or larger or smaller than is, than, than is actually the case. For example, I think that I shall never see a billboard library as a tree. Indeed, unless the billboards fall, I'll never see a tree at all. If you study these senses, you can see a high, a high use of exaggeration. And those are, so these are hyper, hyperbolic statements. Let's look at the language of grammar. Grammar is a form of literature that tells a story through the words and actions of the characters. A drama, also called a play, usually is meant to be performed by actors and actresses in front of an audience. Brecht, 1964, page 15, says that proper plays can only be understood when performed. Stan, Stan Slavs asserts that it is only an it is only on stage that drama can be revealed in all its fullness and significance. To reveal its fullness and significance as a literate form, it is designed for the theatre with characters assigned roles which they act out in actions enacted on stage. Characters can be human beings, supernatural beings, animals or abstract qualities. The raw material of drama is people interacting in a society and that society must be alive. Therefore, drama is an adaptation, a recreation, and reflection of, re of reality on stage, enactment, through the ability to create alternative models of being to that of our existence in measurable flesh and blood. Drama is essentially an art form which can be fully realized in theatre. It is creative experience in which audience, in which audience and actors are engaged in a search which opens up new areas to them. Through watching a play and emphasizing with actors, the audience is equipped to come to terms with the surrounding world. Consequently, drama is distinctive among the genres of literature give its instantaneous impression on the audience. It is employed, it is employed to inform, to educate, to entertain, and in some cases, to mobilize the audience. 
Drama educates by helping the entire society to face its problems and bearing issues by suggesting alternatives as a means of reflection on the human condition and by aging social cohesion, social unity. Drama is a form of literature written for performance, as I said before. All, at, at, all, all at least written in a, stay, in a style that would allow for stage performance. As a text form, drama can be thought of as a story told through spoken remarks and stage directions. Of all literature forms, drama appears closest to visual transcription of speech as well as the encounters and interaction of speech. Predominantly, dramatists convey ideas through their characters and the plots. Instead of a direct embodiment of themselves in the way novelists do with narrators and, poet and poets do with personas. Let us explore more the nature of drama. By its, by, by, by its actual nature and form, drama is performative. Therefore, by reasoning process, it is realizing extensively through performance. However, there are exceptions to this as certain playwrights consciously and productively put pen to paper to make plays principally meant to be read and enjoyed. For instance, Wallace Oyinka writes for performance, but has the reading audience in mind. Nevertheless, drama is meant to be performed before an audience. Though it can be read as a play, the primary goal of drama is action. Until a play gets to the stage, it is yet to be accomplished. Hence, performance is very important in drama. Besides the dramatic form that includes the character, action, actors and setting, putting on a play involves also set designers, costume designers and even a director. The director controls the action, the setting and costume design and costume de designers create a visual representation of the set. Drama is therefore the most collaborative of all forms of literature. The nature of drama is to serve a wide variety of functions at different times and in different places. The Roman writer Horace, in one of the well-known statements about the purpose of literature in general, and drama in particular, said it was designed to delight and instruct. Drama was designed to delight and instruct. Audiences attend plays from a mixture of motivations, including curiosity, pleasure-seeking, and a desire for knowledge or aesthetic experience. But all these experiences are intensified by the public nature of drama. Now, how is language used in drama? Language in drama reflects the seriousness or laughability of a dramatized story. The theme or subject matter of a particular play is determined by the, langu by the language of such a play. The style of the language employed when such a play is a tragedy is different from when it is a comment. Indeed, plays are made for different audiences. The choice of language is therefore determined by the language for which a play is meant and the nature of the play itself, serious or otherwise. The language of drama is patterned on real life conversations among people and yet when we watch a play we have to consider the differences between real talk and drama talk. The language of drama is ultimately always constructed or made up and it often serves several purposes. On the level of the story world of a play, language can of course assume all the pragmatic functions that can be found in real life conversations, for instance, to ensure mutual understanding and to convey information, to persuade or influence someone, to relate one's experience or signal, or signal emotions, and others. Among the devices used in drama 
for serious dramatic effects are dramatic dialogue, iron, pan, allegory, solo, etc. A play exists in dialogues. Therefore, one prominent feature of the language of drama is dialogue or conversation. When they are engaged in dialogues or conversation, characters use language that reveals their status, background, motivations, and other things. What is dramatic irony? Dramatic irony entails a situation where the reader or audience knows something about what's happening in the plot, about which the character or characters have no knowledge. Dramatic irony can be used in comedies and tragedies, and it works to engage the reader as he is drawn into the event. The audience may sympathize with the character who does not know the true situation, or the reader may see the character as blind or ignorant. The clues may be rather obvious, but the, dramatic, but the character may be unwilling to recognize the truth. What a while. In the gods are not to blame is a very good example of a dramatic irony, as the audience knows that he is the one guilty of the culprit, he seeks to punish Shakespeare. Allegory. What is an allegory? This is an expression of truth by means of a particular symbolic meaning. Expression of truth by means of a particular symbolic meaning. The symbolic meaning can be either a character taking on the role of a person, of a person quality or trait, or it can be clues that lead to a deeper meaning. In allegory, abstract qualities are seen and personified into characters. An actual character becomes the quality discussed. What is pun? The primary function of dramatic pun is to capture the conflicts and complex meanings of the character's experience through the individual words. Puns used in comical situations are common in Shakespearean plays. The, the prominence of the puns demonstrates that words, like the human actions they describe, are subject to multiple interpretations. Shakespeare's plays exhibit many different kinds of puns, and characters employ them for multiple functions. Romeo and Juliet is one of the plays with puns. Hamlet, on the other hand, has puns linked to vengeance and desperate states. Soliloch. What is soliloch? This is a dramatic speech uttered by a character speaking aloud alone on the stage. The character thus reveals his or her inner thoughts and feelings to the audience. We see, for example, instances of Solok in Shakespeare's Macbeth and Hamlet. Now let us look as we approach the end of our module. Let us look at the elements of registers. What is the meaning of register? As a signaling system, language varies according to use and users. Language variety according to use has been given the technical term register, while that according to users is referred to as dialect. Language variety according to use has been given the technical term register, while that according to users is referred to as dialect. According to Launch 1995, page 41, the idea of register is in language varieties differentiation can be traced back to Wagner with his argument for language differentiation into field of context distinguished by general subject matter, participants' interests, and other things. As Launch 1995 submits 
further. It is from Wedner's and Magnus's idea that first it draws his concepts of context of situation, emphasizing appropriateness of language in situations. Like most concepts in linguistics, register has been subjected to different interpretations. According to Lekieterian page 1995, page 6, the term was applied by Halliday to mean a variety according to use in the sense that each speaker has a range of varieties and chooses between them at different times. Halliday distinguishes register from direct, which he describes as a variety according to user, in the sense that each speaker uses one variety and uses it all and uses it all the time. In their own case, Gregory and Carol in 1978, page 64, take register to be a use of abstraction linking variations of language to variations of social context. In addition, they see it as a contextual category correlating groupings of linguistic features which with the recurrent situational features. In a simple perspective, when we discuss the concept of register, the use of which language is put in a specific situation is defined. Each situation contains elements of meanings realizable through language. To buttress this point, Long 1985, page 38, cites Halliday and Hassan 1978, saying that register is the set of meanings, the configuration of semantic patterns in specified conditions, along with the words that are typically drawn upon under the realization of those meanings. Different dimensions of situation features are often referred to in the characterization of register, but the core ones are field, tenor, and mode. The field of discourse deals with the significant social action, action, that is, the nature of the social activity engaged in, while the tenor relates to the dimension of the role relationship. The mode of discourse is a matter of the symbolic organization of meanings into speech or writing. Field, tenor, and bold dimensions of register characterization can be regarded as core ones in at least one sense. They correspond with the holidays prepartite function of language as shown here. Field, referring to ideational function, tenor, referring to interpersonal function, and mode, referring to textual function. In the description of register, ROM is made for what is called a situational shift. There can be a shift in the field of discourse, which will trigger which will trigger off a shift in the linguistic features just as shifts in tenor and mode can also occur with corresponding linguistic elements or features. Register therefore determines what we can mean as occasionally by what we are doing with or to whom and through which channel. In other words, registers are different ways of saying different things and tend to define semantics, and hence in lexical grammar, and sometimes in phonology, as a realization of this. The human society in which we live is complex and calls for diverse or different occupations or professions, and each of these professions employs, deploys language in its own peculiar way. The manner in which each profession uses language is its, is its and that's why register is regarded as an occupational variety of languages. The, the variables which are taken into consideration in the description of registers have earlier on been summarized into field, mode, and tenor. These variables determine the range within which meanings are selected and the forms which are used for their expressions. In other words, 
may determine the concept of register. The notions of register simply refer to the fact that the language we use varies according to the situation of use, that is, what we are doing, the participants and the media. Let's look at different registers of human field. We have the field of banking, examples of statements associated with the field of banking are like statement of account, foreign exchange, to overdraw, an account savings department, teller, standing order, loan, bank draft, bad debt, reconciliatory account, back room, check, etc. Those are terms that are commonly used with the field of banking. What about wedding? You go to a wedding, or rather you read about wedding, you hear people talking about wedding, you hear them saying words like bride, bride, groom, best man, chief brides, maid, maid, pages, wedding ring, ring bearing, cutting the wedding cake, marriage register, officiating minister, reception, for better, for worse, till death do us part, and other forms of registers that are used in wedding. What about burial? With burial, you can hear such words like corpse, remains, undertakes, weight keeping, funeral oration, last rites obituary, cemetery, F to F, dust to dust, dust, etc. And in the field of football, you are most likely to hear words like central referee, assistant referee, full charge, 18 yard box, pen up kick, free kick, left winger, midfielder, attacking midfielder, de defending midfielder, goalless draw, score draw, half time, and others. And in the field of law, you are most likely to hear words like counsel, plaintiff, alibi, injunction, jurisdiction, civil case, criminal case, for want of evidence, for want of evidence, court summons, honors of proof, discharge and acquitted, contempt of court, by lobby offense, short, pigeon, lacquer stand, and others. Language is a maker of identity and when we speak our we, and when we speak or write, we show the type of the type of persons we are. Whether people be belonging to the field of banking or law and so forth. We show the type of persons we are, we show what we do or are doing and the type of social relationship we have with our interlocutors. This, therefore, is the kernel of the concept of register in language description. Registers and their peculiar linguistic features. The register of bureaucracy, it is characterized by passive senses to avoid personal responsibility. For example, I'm directed, one says I'm directed. One cannot say the boss directed me because that becomes too, too, too personal. It is also characterized by peculiar words and expressions such as transfer of service, termination of appointment, emolument, workforce, minutes, memos, agenda, directives, etc. Peculiar abbreviations like B, F, K, I, V, P, A, D, P, M, D, D, F, etc are what characterize the register of bureaucracy. What about legal register? It is characterized by use of archaic words and expressions. Examples, witnesses, a false saying, where to fall, holding, etc. The legal register is also characterized by absence of punctuation, very long sentences without punctuations. The legal register is also characterized by peculiar words and expressions such as plaintiff, respondent, accused, prosecutor, perjury, want of evidence, proof beyond reasonable doubt, etc. 
What about the register of science, the language of, 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 of orthodox medicine, which subsumes that of nursing, shares, my, shares many features with the register of science, and these include use of exact and precise word or expression, specialized or technical terms, passive constructions to imbue the register with impersonal or scientific objectivity. So let's look at the three major determinants of elements of register. We have field, tenor, and mode. The field of discourse refers to what is happening. That is, the nature of the social interaction taking place. That is the field of discourse. Tenor of discourse is also known as the style of discourse. This accounts for the formality or informality of the linguistic medium. And mode, the mode is the symbolic organization of the text. For example, the rhetorical mode, the, the, the rhetorical mode, mode is persuasive, expository, didactic, etc. It emphasizes the channel of communication, such as spoken or written, monologic, dialogic, visual contact, computer-mediated communication, telephone conversation, and the other models by which communication can be expressed. What about point of view? The point of view is a narrative device which literally means the position at which one looks at anything. It is the way the novelist sees characters and how he reveals them in his inner mind, which may differ from that of the reader. Thus, point of view determines through whose perspective the story is told. Point of view enhances our ability to identify the narrator of a literal piece. The three major types of point of view in novels are first person point of view, which include observations of a character who narrates the story. We also have third person point of view, limited, referring to outside narration, focusing on one's character's observations, and third person omniscient, which means all knowing narrator outside the story itself. And others are second person, objective, limited omniscient, and alternating person, point, person points of view. You need to note this point of view enhances our ability to identify the narrator of a literal piece. The three major types of point of view in novels, like first person point of view, third person point of view, third person omniscient, second person, objective, limited, om limited omniscient, and alternating person point of views, all these help us to identify the one who tells the story. Points of view in literature undoubtedly expose issues behind the narration of literary texts. With a point of view, the story is constructed, and with it, the story is interpreted. Authors or writers give coherence to their works through the right point of view, and they reveal character's way of thinking as shaped by his own experience, mindset, and history. This marks the end of the six modules of OLT 133, Language and Literature. I thank you very much for having followed me all the way through the six modules. My name is Johanna Makeja John from the Open University of Tanzania. Thank you, thank you very much. You are welcome for, uh, welcome for more studies.